Hello and welcome to the 8th annual Swedbank Economic Forum. It's 8th annual forum where uh, Swedbank economists from Nordic and Baltic countries share their insights on what is the most relevant things that are happening today in the world and what we can expect going forward. I did not expect that for the second time in a row we will not be able to, to meet safely live and discuss uh, and interact, uh, not online, but uh, in, in a physical meeting. Uh, I'm sure that we will have 9th and 10th Swedbank Economic Forum, and I hope that uh, the second one will be the last one where we cannot meet and interact. Arguably, it has become much more difficult to predict the future. The world is becoming more complex and is moving more faster. To illustrate that, imagine uh, labor markets. A year ago, the world was worried about levels of unemployment and how to pre prevent uh, the levels of unemployment uh, rising further. Today, the most pressing problem in many Western countries is labor shortages. Not enough people who are willing and able to work. So rapidly, the world and the economic environment has changed. Another uh, interesting phenomenon on which many economists do not agree and uh, argue vigorously is inflation. How transitory current spike in inflation will be? Uh, will it have lasting effects? What will be its possible effects on, uh, not only on uh, uh, household purchasing power but also on asset prices? So many of these topics will be covered in uh, six interesting presentations today. Brief and concentrated, but very interesting presentations today. And without further ado, I give the floor to Swedbank Group Chief Economist, uh, Matthias Persson, who will share his insights on global economic outlook and what we can expect from the COVID-19 crisis going forward. Matthias? Thank you very much, Nelius. It's, uh, it's a pleasure being here and presenting. So I'll give you some overview of uh, what do we see uh, looking forward. And what we do see in front of us is an outlook which is quite bright. But at the same time, of course, there are always clouds. And some of them are quite dark. But the outlook is really uh, good, bright. And it's coming, being a faster recovery than we expected earlier this year. Several countries, including the Nordics, US, um, have already rebounded back to the level of GDP that they had before the crisis. So the recovery has been very, very quick. And as, uh, as uh, Nelius already mentioned and talked about, um, also improvements in labor markets have been much quicker than we and many others expected. And there are growing labor shortages all over uh, the Western uh, and global economies. So if you look at the chart, you can really see what a strong rebound we have. So global growth for this year uh, on 6% and next year of 4.7% is extraordinary high figures. One probably have to go back to the 60s to find global growth being this strong. So it is a very positive environment looking forward uh, and it looks very bright. Of course, there are always some clouds and I'll come to that at the end or, or the middle of my presentation. So demand globally has been very, very strong. For some sectors, it has been strong throughout the crisis. And there are supply shortages in many sectors. What we hear most about is semiconductors, but there are other uh, input goods as well. Even food, clothes are also having uh, supply constraints. So if you look at the, the, the figure, to the left, you can see new orders in, in German manufacturing. And, and the yellow one is clearly indicating a peak. But then the red one, the production, has difficulties actually delivering that. And that's partly because of supply shortages. We see that in many countries. We expect that for Sweden, for example. We see that in the US. We see that also in France and in many other countries, that supply shortages are impacting uh, production. And that will also mean that Yes, we will see continued high growth going forward, but it could take, there could be a, a bit lower pace and a longer recovery due to uh, some of the supply, 
uh, constraints that we have in global uh, economy. And to the right, you can see uh, German uh, production of motor vehicles, where actually uh, semiconductors uh, are impacting production. We see the same in Swedish car and truck manufacturing, the same in Japanese. It's a global phenomenon. And that, that will probably take some time to sort out. And that will also have implications for inflation, I think. And I'll come back to that. I think we might need to think about temporary as being a, a bit longer than just, you know, maybe six months. So, but it's a strong outlook. There is strong demand. Uh, and now the downside, what we see is, of course, the continue, continuation of the pandemic. The most concern currently is about the Delta variant, which is spreading quickly. We see that in the US where the number of people in, in hospital in a number of states are three times higher now than it was a year ago. In Sweden, in the Baltic economies, also uh, the number of people being uh, confirmed with Corona are increasing, although from low levels. But so what we assume in our forecast is that the high vaccination levels that we have, in particular in Western economies in, in Europe, will help mitigate the spread of the uh, Delta variant. So if you look at the world map, countries with dark green are countries where vaccinations have proceeded very quickly and where a large proportion of the population is vaccinated fully. As you can see, our regions, the US, uh, parts of South America, China uh, and Australia have high vaccination levels, but many other countries, it's much lower. In particular, if you think about India, about 12%, Indonesia, pretty much the same, and, and some other countries in Asia and of course in Africa, uh, the, the vaccination level is very low. That is a concern. Of course, the Delta variant can spread very quickly in those areas, and that could impact supply challenges even more. And that would mean that the return and the recovery will be a bit lower and probably continue uh, for, for addi some additional time. So it is an area of concern, but it's not only about the Delta variants. There are also other, Mu, Lambda, and there are a couple of, um, of uh, viruses of concern uh, or variants of concern that not, don't even have names yet. So the fact that the vaccination level is lower in a large part of the world could become a risk to all of us. And that's something that needs to be mitigated and handled on a global level. Now, um, if we turn to the developments in the US in the Eurozone, we do have a very positive view on those economies and areas. We can see that uh, growth in, in US pulls ahead of the Euro area, but Europe is finally taking off. And the reason for that is, of course, the lifting of, of restriction in Europe during the summer. So in particular, Spain and Italy have developed very, very quickly, whereas uh, manufacturing in Germany partly because of the supply shortages, are having some difficulties. So we do see growth in your area picking up. It's very good and it's very welcome that we see that. And I think when I look at uh, the changes in developments between the US and, and, and the Euro area, I think one of the, for me, one of the biggest explanations is that fiscal policy has been more expansionary in the US than in the Euro area. So if we look at the US today, of course, there are concerns about the Delta variants. It's, it's spreading a lot. We have seen consumer confidence coming down uh, in the latest uh, number. We have seen the labor market not really returning. Now we have inflation's figure coming out later today. And inflation is uh, the big topic, I think. Will it be transitory or will it last for much longer? Or could there be inflation coming back? And do central banks need to react much earlier maybe than we have anticipated. Here, looking at the inflation in Euro area in, in blue and the US in green, we can see that the difference between the two areas have never been as high as it is today. 
it is quite a volatile, in particular, uh, the difference between them. But for me, again, I think the main driver between the different in inflation is fiscal policy. The stimuli for monetary policy is pretty much the same in the euro area and in the US, but fiscal policy in the US is much more expansionary. I'm not saying that the euro area haven't been as expansionary. It is. It's just that since Joe Biden came in, uh, the programs have been quite enormous and there will be more uh, that will play in. So what will happen with inflation? I think there is a lot of factors that are, talking from, that are indicating that this is temporary. But then when you see supply shortages and labor market shortages, um, you know, having an impact on developments now, then I think there is a risk that we, there will also actually be, you know, a bit longer for the inflation to stay, stay a bit higher. I'm very much concerned. I'm very much convinced that there are, in particular, temporary factors affecting inflation, both in the U.S. and in the area. Euro area, for example, energy. In the U.S., we have rental cars. We have opening effects, which are very obvious in inflation. But since we have the shortages in the labor market and in the uh, supply of, of, of goods, I think for me, you know, maybe we need to think about temporary as being more than six months, maybe a year, a year and a half, where we actually can see inflation being a bit higher. Then it depends on how central banks will react to that and whether or not one, one actually can judge for how long it will be temporary. But it, for me, it's obvious it will not go away uh, until you know, it takes some time. Um, so it, 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 I think it's something that we will come back to later in the presentation and I think will be a challenge for central banks uh, to manage. So if we look at China, I think China, as always, are extremely interesting. We have seen a solid recovery, so we expect the growth of China for 8.2%. But looking forward, we do expect growth to come down. Uh, one, one reason for that, of course, is the zero tolerance when it comes to the COVID today. We have seen weaknesses uh, lately in, in, in China. PMI, for example, in China has been falling since, since April. And the zero tolerance means that they, you know, one, people being uh, infected by corona and a closer harbor, a harbor that is important for global trade. Of course, that has implication for the supply shortages, but also for growth in, in China. Then uh, China's relations with the EU and the US are cold. I think it will be important to having a, a better communication and a better trade relationships between the EU and, and US and China going forward. And then uh, there has been a crackdown in China over the last couple of weeks uh, for everything from education to gaming, deciding how long children or anybody actually can play video games over, over the phones or, or internet, um, restricting it to be one hour a day. Of course, all of that will have implications. For example, on what kind of a demand there are for ver various types of games. If it's a game that takes a long time, of course, you don't, ex you don't demand that because you can only pay for one hour. But then the latest one was, came out yesterday uh, when uh, the Chinese authorities uh, cracked down on uh, Alipay and wanted to split it up into different companies. So what does all, about, all this about common prosperity, the new Chinese policy, actually imply? for growth in China, I think will be very interesting uh, in looking forward and in, in uh, following going forward. I think it will have implications and profound implications for global growth and global trade. So we will have to see uh, exactly what that will mean um, for our home markets as well. So I think I'll stop there, uh, Nereus. I think I'll hand over to you. And then I think uh, Andreas will step in. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Matthias. Um, I uh, forgot to mention to our clients that you can submit your questions, which we will address at the end of all the presentations. I see some of you already are sending in these questions. They will not be lost, and we will discuss this um, at the end. 
so yes, thank you, Matthias, for your insights. We see that this is uh, an unusual crisis uh, because after the unprecedented fall uh, in spring of last year, we saw an unprecedentedly rapid recovery uh, thanks to monetary and fiscal policy, and the future looks bright. Uh, growth is expected to continue at uh, above the pre-pandemic uh, uh, trend. But of course, there are always uh, risks and there are always uh, things to consider and that can change our forecast. So for that, I invite um, my colleague uh, Andreas Wallström, head of uh, Swedbank Forecasting. He will share his insights on uh, what can go wrong and what can go right. Andreas? Yes, thank you very much for that introduction. And I'm so happy to be here again. Uh, this is actually the second time for me in this fora, uh, both that digitally, obviously. So I will uh, continue uh, where uh, Matthias ended uh, and fill in a bit on the global outlook and then discuss uh, all the risks out there to our outlook, which, of course, as always, they are quite a few. But uh, that said, you know, just to underline the, the very bullish expectations out there now on global growth, these are the numbers actually from the IMF latest forecast for all the countries in the world. Uh, and as you can see, it is the greener, the higher growth, right? So uh, the first thing here is to notice that, you know, almost all countries are actually growing you know, in terms of the economy. There are a few ex uh, exceptions, uh, I can mention them. There are, uh, Belarus, uh, Bhutan, Bangladesh, and Venezuela. Okay, those economies are actually declining, but otherwise uh, it's quite a big boom out there. Um, notably, uh, both the US and China will go above 6% this year. Uh, so this is quite, as uh, Matthias also mentioned, exceptional times indeed. And if we also move forward, you know, this is for 2021, uh, comparing to 2020, which of course was quite a weak year. But if we look into 2022, it's also, it's very, very green picture. So these are the consensus forecasts out there, actually. We uh, have now uh, forecasts that uh, you know, change um, or differ from that. So what could then get wrong? I mean, the, the first obvious thing, um, the, the major downside risk uh, in the near term, as Matthias mentioned, is all, it's obviously the pandemic. You know, it's not over yet. We have new mutations coming. Currently, it's the Delta variant that uh, really frightens us. So we see uh, the risk picture to, to our forecast as unbalanced. You know, we, there are mainly downside risks in the short term. Uh, one way this could play out more negatively than we had expected is uh, the second bullet here. If the virus will spread more widely in Asia, where the vaccination rates are lower, uh, then we could see that... Uh, uh, that could affect global trade more heavily, uh, worsening of the supply chains that we already had problems with. And that, of course, is a major risk for manufacturing, exports and those sectors. I think this you know, scenario is quite likely. Uh, it's, uh, it's not our best case. Our best case is still that actually manufacturing and the export sector will grow uh, over the next few years. But you know, we can't rule out uh, for surely that manufacturing sector and exports will be hit much more severely uh, in this situation. Then the last bullet here is, uh, you know, we can't rule that out either, that we will uh, once again face more strict lockdowns, you know, uh, in Europe uh, at large, in the US, uh, since the, the pressure on the healthcare system again will be very high, uh, they, uh, the politicians will, will uh, choose to uh, close down uh, the economies, and that, of course, will have a major impact on the broader sense of the economies. That, uh, however, I find less likely because we have those uh, high vaccination rates in general in Europe and also in the US, although actually Europe is now going ahead. The US vaccination rate uh, has not improved that much of the recent past. 
Okay, that was the delta variant. That is the most obvious short-term uh, risk. So our basic assumption is that you know the world will not shut down again. We will not see those closed downs as we had uh, earlier in the spring. Uh, but uh, that said, uh, the the delta mutation, the other mutations, the pandemic is not, of course, uh, the only risk out there. There are, as usual, always a lot of risks out there. One such uh, risk, uh, which I think uh, Nereus will talk about more later on, is uh, the elevated asset prices. So I will not dig into that much more. Um, I think in general, I'm in favor, I, I think very much on low for long in yields, and that will probably support asset prices going forward in our forecast horizon. That's our base case. That said, of course, you know, all, just small corrections or rises in interest rates could, of course, then lead to a bigger correction in asset prices. Then we have inflation risks that I will talk about more later on. Uh, climate change has been a risk for many years now, and you could, uh, you could argue that there are two different kinds of risks related to climate change. We have first the most perhaps obvious one that we will see we are facing more extreme weather events, draftings, uh, floodings. Uh, that will, of course, uh, affect the economies in different ways, both the growth, but also inflation. Then we have what you could call uh, more transition risks. Um, transition risks, um, to explain those, uh, perhaps, I don't know if you have read the book, uh, the old book by Hemingway uh, called The Sun Also Rises. In this book, uh, there is this character uh, who's going bankrupt. And he asks, so why did you go bankrupt? And his answer is, uh, well, uh, I did go bankrupt in two ways. First, gradually, and then suddenly. Uh, that is uh, a way you could look at the climate change or the transition to a cl more climate-friendly world that we have for long known this risk. Uh, we have adapted too slowly, so it's been gradual. But now when everyone perhaps realizes, also the politicians that we have to do something about it, you will have you know, quite sharp correction in terms of prices and markets. So we will have a lot of stranded assets, for example. Uh, so that's quite a clear major risk, I think, for the forecast horizon. Uh, on top of that, we, as always, we also have geopolitical risks. Uh, the most recent example, perhaps, is uh, the situation in Afghanistan. Afghanistan is mainly, I think, a, a humanitarian catastrophe. It's not really uh, that important for the global economic outlook. Of course, uh, there is a risk for you know big cyber attacks. Uh, we had one in Sweden recently for a big. Uh, a food store company, uh, they are going on continuously throughout the world. And of course, that could also be big things uh, for the economic outlook. So these are, you know, just a few of the risks out there. These are the known risks. Uh, so then we have all the black swans, of course. But I will talk more about, uh, and Matthias was also into this topic uh, on the inflation matter, uh, which is, I think, uh, the most hot topic in financial markets for the moment. Will it be sustained or not? Then I think uh, it's uh, different uh, depending on which region you look at. If we look at the euro area, for example, uh, my view of the euro area as a whole is that the inflation risks are quite low. Uh, this is illustrated by the chart to the left here. Uh, this is not inflation, actually, but it is actually the consumer price index as such. As you know, inflation is a change from one year to another. So that's a 12-month uh, change. The reason why we last week got this super high inflation number in the euro area uh, it was 3%. Uh, in Germany, it was 3.4%, very, very high in, in a historic comparison. Uh, the major explanation to that was that we had one year ago uh, very low uh, inflation, uh, where actually prices fell. And they continued to fall throughout the autumn and just turned up uh, in January this year. 
So that means when we look at the annual changes on this uh, consumer price index, we will see elevated numbers throughout this autumn and not until the beginning of next year, we will see a more modest inflation. But is that something sustained? Uh, no, probably not will be my first bet. Uh, if you look at the historical situation and inflation in the euro area, it's been extremely low, actually. You know, they've had this target for almost or close to 2%. And uh, the ECB, uh, if you look at what has happened to core inflation over the past 20 years, it's first actually trended downwards. And the deviation to the 2% target has been quite large. Uh, so over the past 10 years, the average inflation actually has been only 1%, uh, while it should have been close to 2 you could, of course, argue that one is quite close to 2%, so it's not a big thing. And I, I you know, fully appreciate this argument, but for central banks, this is a big difference, actually, and not really uh, acceptable. And therefore, now with the new ECB uh, target that they will have a symmetric 2% target, this would be, of course, tricky times to get inflation up uh, more sustained uh, in in. Uh, Euro, in the euro as a whole. Uh, we actually got uh, last week uh, ECB's latest projection also for inflation. This is what you can see in the blue box here. So uh, for this year, they estimate that overall inflation will actually be 2.2%. But then already as from next year, uh, we will have inflation of 1.7 and 1.5%. That is actually below then the target. But on average, then quite close to target over the next few years. Uh, interestingly, uh, you know, this is a big decision from last week. Didn't uh, you know make much noise on financial markets? I think uh, yesterday's speech by uh, Isabel Schnabel was more important. Typically, she's been seen as a dub, quite soft in a sense. But she had a speech uh, yesterday in Germany. Uh, where I extracted two uh, quotations or citations from her, which I find a bit actually more hawkish. You know? uh, and one thing she was quite um, frank, uh, saying that you know, what they've actually done over the past year is that they have undermested uh, inflation rather than overestimated inflation, which is they typically have done for, if you look at in the longer horizon. Uh, also, uh, she said that, you know, should inflation sustainably reach our target 2% unexpectedly soon, we will act equally quickly and resolutely. And that was quite strong word when usually they talk about the, the downside risks and they will stay lenient. But she also actually mentioned uh, the, the risk that they could actually um, act more strongly uh, in the other way, simply. Perhaps this was just a, a way to, uh, you know, um, please the German audience, who knows. Then if we look at the US, you know, the, there is very much focus on financial markets, of course, what's happening in the US and what will the Fed do next in terms of tapering. Uh, I think it's quite uh, another situation in the U.S. compared to the euro area. Uh, we have seen wage growth picking up already in the U.S. And if you look at most indicators, they still very much point to higher wage growth going forward. And here are two examples. So if we look at the, to the left. They ask companies, uh, so uh, do you plan to uh, increase wages? And uh, quite a few, actually, uh, most, uh, the highest share of companies in 20 years says, yes, we have to increase wages. And uh, it's been a correlation to actual wage growth, as you can see also from the chart uh, over the past 20 years. So that's one indication of how higher wage growth. Another one is if you actually look at um, how employees behave. Um, if you look at the job quits rates, uh, which is then the, you know, the share of employees that each period uh, choose to actually quit their jobs. And this is also typically related to the business cycle. The better times, the more likely that you are uh, uh, actually quitting. 
Uh, and this also continued to point upwards. So I think there are you know, quite many actually indicators in the short term pointing to wage growth coming up in the US. And that would be a very important driver also for inflation, I would argue. Uh, the big picture is uh, in the chart to the left here. Uh, it's been a strong correlation historically. This is over the past, actually, what is it, 70 years. Um, uh, or 60 years, actually. Over the past 60 years, it's a strong correlation between wage growth and inflation, as you can see. Uh, this is also for Europe, actually. Uh, in the 70s and in the 80s, we had this high wage growth, and that also led to, fed into um, uh, higher inflation. If you don't see a wage growth coming up more sustained basis, I don't think you, you should expect inflation coming up or on a more sustained basis either. Another topic very interesting for the US is uh, now uh, the this afternoon where we'll have the CPI inflation. Uh, people will really watch what's happening with house prices in the CPI. You know, it's not really directly included, but to some extent included. And here, uh, given what has happened on the housing market, it's a big discussion now how that will actually feed into the CPI prices. And that's a big share of core CPI, actually 30%. So by some estimates, this will actually lead to the CPI, house prices CPI uh, increasing by some you know, five, six, seven percent uh, in one year or so. And that surely will be something uh, that lifts overall inflation and could lead to the Fed actually being more hawkish than now anticipated. So my final slide is on our outlook on central banks and perhaps the focus here should be on the Fed then, which is the most interesting. Our base case is still that uh, they will start tapering, that is to reduce their purchasing um, each monthly purchases uh, of bonds uh, in December this year, right? And then they will be, uh, they will continue to taper uh, in a year or so. And then uh, first uh, in 2023, they will actually hike rates two times. I think if we will see this more elevated inflation being a bit more sustained, as Matthias mentioned, perhaps not just for the next six months, but perhaps 12 or 18 months, we could see actually Fed hiking more early than 2023. And that could be also, of course, a big thing for financial markets. So I stop there. Thank you, Andreas, uh, for your insights on uh, risks and uh, inflation. And uh, we already have uh, quite a few good questions. And one question I know will be addressed by the next speaker. And that is uh, from these questions, I see that uh, inflation is the topic that uh, creates a heated debate, not only among the economists, but also a lot of clients are worried how sustained and how problematic this will be. And we have a question about the transportation costs from China to Europe. How come it has risen so quickly so much? And uh, when and if it's going to normalize in the short term? And uh, the best person to answer this question is my colleague from Norway, uh, Shettel Martinsen, chief economist at Swedbank Norway. Uh, please uh, indulge us and tell us what to expect going forward. Well, thank you very much, uh, Nereus. Um, happy to be uh, be on today as well. Um, indeed, and as a background, I would say it's uh, is first of all quite interesting to hear all three speakers um, before me uh, talking about supply chains, because very often when we have a uh, economic downturn on a, or a crisis, there's certain characteristics uh, surrounding uh, that. Uh, crisis. Uh, take the financial crisis, for instance, with you know a lot of focus on the on the subprime and the housing market, and eventually bankruptcies and and banks. Um, of course, everything about the, the COVID nineteen has been a health crisis. But in economic terms, um, supply chains have been one of the hot, really hot topics uh, over the past year. So let's try to dig a bit more into what has happened and what you think about uh, supply chains and, of course, impacts on um, global um, economies going, going forward. Uh, before we start with the current situation, uh, we need to discuss 
a bit about where were we standing going into the pandemic. Um, and with this chart, I've taken out a, a ratio between inventories and, and sales. This is from the US. And everything about uh, supply chains, uh, it's a bit hard to get very good data on, uh, on, <clears throat> on these uh, topics. Mostly because it's uh, it's very let's say company uh, based and it's hard to get the, the broad picture of of how uh, supply chains actually actually work in in make in macro data. Uh, but with this chart, I'm trying to show you that over time and especially after the uh, global financial crisis, there has been a much, let's say, leaner global uh, supply chains. So companies throughout the world has taken down their inventories, both in terms of cost efficiency, uh, but also because um, globalization has made it more efficient to you know, have um, leaner uh, supply chains or uh, what the Toyota um, coined it back in the days as, as just-in-time production. Um, so the robustness of the global supply chains has also been uh, much more limited as we entered um, the, um, the pandemic uh, early last year. So having that in mind, we were standing at the situation for the global economy where if we had this, you know, uh, a real uh, lockdown on, on the economies that um, supply chains would be more fragile. And indeed, that's uh, what we got. So the Great Lockdown hit all economies, so to speak, and it hit both the service sector and also the, uh, the manufacturing sector in the beginning. Later on, only a couple of months after um, March uh, of last year, which kind of marked the, the European, at least, the start of the pandemic, um, the manufacturing sector started to, to open up again. And with that, we also had a continued strict restrictions in the service sectors. So governments throughout the, the world started to uh, hand out cash and, and boost fiscal policies uh, to an extent we have not seen before. So with this chart, I'm just trying to, to show you um, how much fiscal policy actually reacted uh, due to um, or trying to avoid a more severe economic downturn owing to uh, government restrictions owing to the, to the pandemic. So on a global scale, we're having more than 15% of GDP added in fiscal stimulus. And we see that United States and United Kingdom and also Japan has been way higher uh, in terms of their own uh, GDP ratios. And with that, you're kind of having one sector still uh, restrained uh, and, and locked down to, to certain levels, uh, being the service sector. Uh, households, uh, using US again as an example, actually had higher income growth than they had in the years prior to the pandemic, owing to very uh, extreme uh, fiscal uh, stimulus. So we ended up with a very divided global economy where the manufacturing sector, well, overheated to some sense, uh, while the, the service sector continued to hibernate. So not only are you having restrictions put on companies with social distancing, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But you're also putting so much money into the pockets of both businesses and, and households that they're starting to demand more goods uh, than they did before the pandemic uh, and shifting their consumption away from services into, into goods. So certainly um, you're overheating the, the quite fragile uh, supply chains going uh, forward and into uh, the pandemic. Uh, and indeed, this is actually what we are seeing. Uh, Matthias mentioned it with uh, German car uh, production being hampered by uh, low supply of uh, semiconductors. This is a different viewpoint of the exact same story. With 65% of German uh, manufacturing businesses, uh, interviewed by the, by the EFO survey, saying that there is a shortage of input material 
uh, that should go into their production and hampering their production. And we're seeing the exact same thing across the, across the globe, again, uh, from the US. Delivery times, this is an inverted index, so when it's declining, it means that uh, delivery times are indeed increasing. And they have been increasing at the pace we have never seen before. Uh, although, you know, they have a lot of demand and, and the backlog of, of work index has risen uh, to levels we uh, haven't seen uh, either. So, in essence, this is a very strange development in the sense that you continue to uh, reduce capacity in one sector, shifting all um, close to uh, or shifting more of the consumption over to another sector that indeed are having uh, issues just because uh, demand is simply too too high and there's also um, problems on the on the supply side relating to uh, pandemic uh, restrictions as well. Uh, and one of these pandemic restrictions hampering supply um, is a very nice example on, on the freight rates. Um, there is, you mentioned, uh, why have freight rates increased or transportation costs increased so much uh, from, from China or Asia to, to Europe? And one of the reasons for this particular uh, event is taken from the third largest uh, harbor in the world, the Nanjing uh, Harbor in, in China. Uh, and you should also remember and have in the background that China's uh, COVID policies has been quite different from what we have seen in the Western world with a zero um, uh, tolerance policy, not very far away from what we have seen in Australia and also New Zealand, that they want to take down all infection rates and, and have really zero tolerance towards new infection rates. So when you had only a handful of new in, in uh, new cases in and surrounding that harbor, they actually closed it down for more than a week. Uh, and with that, you saw that uh, freight rates, because there is high demand for <laughs> shipping goods uh, from Asia to Europe, owing to um, the need for um, manufacturing goods, um, shipping rates actually increased sevenfold uh, within a very short period of time, actually only this summer. So we have all of these very knee-jerk um, increases in, in prices and in uh, where uh, the supply chain certainly has been too fragile to, to overcome the, the difficulties we have seen caused by the pandemic and with the additional uh, fiscal stimulus, stimulus uh, on top of that. Uh, going a bit forward, also related to prices, uh, but there's a, have a, there haven't a lot in the commodity space as well. Um, I think perhaps supply chains are more interesting from a kind of economic point of view, but certainly also commodities have been uh, reaching um, uh, headlines throughout this pandemic as well. You had negative oil prices in, in April of last year. Now they're back to above $70 per barrel. Uh, but this is a very, this example here is a very wide range of the 20 most common commodities used in, in the world. Um, and what I'm trying to depict here is the percent rank. So if you take all price quotations, every daily price quotation from 2015 and uh, up till today, and you rank them by price, you will have the, the highest price ever seen would be 100. The lowest price will be zero. And as you can see from this chart, out of these 20 uh, commodities, including aluminium, coffee, oil, uh, gold, and different uh, food types of commodities. All of them are above the 50 threshold. And indeed, most of them are concentrated above the 80% threshold. Now, this should be seen both as very strong demand, uh, owing to fiscal policy again, uh, but also there's a lot of uh, supply stories around. The, the aluminium price have, has increased markedly only over the past couple of uh, weeks. Um, and that was related to uh, the military coup in, in Guinea, 
whereas in uh, uh, <laughs> in the coffee price, uh, there's again a lot of uh, pandemic related supply issues as well. Um, with, for example, Vietnam having uh, very high infection rates uh, over the past months and being one of the biggest coffee producer um, of um, in the world. So again, uh, it's a matter of both the demand and supply uh, leading to, to higher prices. One of perhaps the best examples of these types of commodity cycles we have seen, not a, not a typical super cycle, but where uh, supply uh, gets very limited and uh, demand uh, skyrockets, has been the, the lumber price. And <clears throat> oh, uh, yeah, uh, has been the, the lumber price. And what we saw there is that they reduced production uh, going into the pandemic because they thought, well, overall, a demand for lumber and house building will perhaps be quite low uh, if uh, the economy runs into a, a deep downturn. Well, the exact opposite happened. House prices around the Western world has uh, again increased markedly um, and also <laughs> with people, you know, being forced to stay at home. A lot of this housing uh, focus has uh, markedly increased as well. So the demand for uh, lumber actually increased so much that uh, prices uh, skyrocketed and, and reached very high levels uh, last spring. Now, the thing about commodity spikes is that they're often short-lived and the lumber price is a very good example of this because capacity is much easier to increase. You can find other sources of, uh, of capacity and also demand will self-adjust being that when prices increase so much, uh, an average house uh, in the country where I reside would increase only in material costs by roughly 30,000 euros to build. So in itself, demand will also uh, decline a bit. And this is also what has happened to the, to the lumber prices. Um, so you could expect, take the coffee uh, situation, for instance, you should expect demand to stay quite, you know, flattish going forward. So when you lo loosen up on the supply issues in, for example, countries like Vietnam, uh, prices are deemed to, to fall back. Um, so if you look at the effects or the short term consequences, from these types of supply chain and commodity uh, issues. We should expect to be continued quite high inflation, um, as Matthias mentioned, and also uh, Andreas. Uh, <clears throat> but you should expect them to be more temporary in that sense, um, that commodity prices will most likely decline again to uh, levels seen before the, the crisis, simply because uh, you loosen up on the supply restrictions. What I'm more curious about uh, going forward into the next years is what will happen to supply chains. Because what we have seen now is the, the fragility of supply chains has really hampered productions uh, in a lot of countries. And the dependence on both shipping uh, and also uh, third countries uh, far, far away, has perhaps brought this attention back to uh, company owners that they should perhaps have more robust supply chains. So one of the, let's call them long-term consequences, could be that you see um, a moderation in the globalization trends we have had over the past uh, decades in the sense that you want to have more robust supply chains, moving production also in uh, input factors closer to your uh, company. Um, and that's stories we've heard uh, also from domestic clients uh, in Norway, that they really trying to shift uh, input uh, manufacturing closer to their uh, home base. So that could be, uh, one of the long-term consequences in macro uh, for uh, the issues we've seen in, in the supply chains over the past past years. Um, and with that, I, um, I hand it back to you, Nerius.
sorry. Thank you, Shetel. I think um, the story of uh, deglobalization or slow globalization is uh, going to be very interesting going forward. And it concerns many markets. Uh, and uh, we see, for example, uh, semiconductors. This, the, it's not only the shortage that we have them, but also geopolitical risks associated with the supply of semiconductors. Only 15% um, of the global semiconductor production is in the United States, 5% is in Europe, the rest is in Asia. So uh, a lot of these strategic uh, decisions will be made perhaps to move the uh, production. And US has a very specific clear plan to start producing more semiconductor and chips uh, in US. Uh, Lithuania wanna ha wants to have the semiconductor factory as well. We'll see how that works out. Um, but clearly, deglobalization could also play a role in uh, higher inflationary forces. If you want to produce uh, cleaner, safer uh, things closer to home in a more sustainable way with a shorter supply chains, that is very welcome, but that will cost uh, more. And uh, with this, I move. Uh, I have a very smooth transition to uh, inflationary forces and how they might affect uh, asset uh, markets with my brief presentation. I forgot to introduce myself at the beginning of the event. I am Nerius Machulis. I'm chief economist at Swedbank um, uh, Lithuania. And uh, I will talk a little bit on inflation. Again, as I said, uh, I think in almost every presentation today, inflation will be touched upon. And this is uh, one of the charts that was shown by Shettle, the um, uh, transportation costs uh, from Shanghai port uh, on average to all the other ports around the world. Um, and uh, this may, it is very likely to be transitory. There is no reason why transportation costs should remain three, four or, or ten times larger than they were before. But at the same time, uh, this kind of uh, supply is not easy to increase very rapidly. The, the major shipping companies, Maersk and others, they are not in a hurry to build more ships for many reasons. They are not sure how long this spurt in demand for goods will last, uh, and it takes at least two years to build a, a container ship. They don't, they're not sure what kind of fuel future ships will be using, uh, and uh, they don't want to build a, a, a dirty fuel using ships that will become obsolete uh, in, in five or ten years. So there are a lot of uncertainties in this uh, in, in here. Um, but uh, as already was mentioned by uh, Matthias, Andreas and others, uh, the inflationary spike that we see now is uh, to a large extent is caused by these temporary spikes in transportation and commodities. But at the same time, there are not so temporary factors. Um, uh, one is possible deglobalization. Uh, another one is, uh, of course, um, government policy. And one reason why during the last decade, even with a very expansionary monetary policy after the global financial crisis, we have not seen any inflation, neither in US nor in Euro area, was because at the same time, uh, fiscal policy was quite restrictive, especially in Euro area. So monetary policy was not very effective because at the same time governments were implementing fiscal austerity, were curtailing spending, increasing taxes, and that of course translated into smaller aggregate demand and no inflation. This time around it's very different. It's at the same time both feet on both accelerators. We have very uh, uh, accommodative and stimulative monetary policy and governments are willing to take the money to borrow at the record low interest rates and to spend to prevent bankruptcies, to prevent increase in unemployment, to prevent um, uh, uh, all the negative side effects of the pandemic. And as Matthias already said, this was one of the major reasons why the recovery after the, uh, the shock last year was so rapid and unexpectedly uh, uh, quick and forceful. But at the same time, this creates sort of a symmetric risks uh, and it's very difficult for the governments. If they remove the stimulus too quickly, you may see a wave of bankruptcies and uh, negative long lasting effects on the labor market. If you keep it for too long, then you create the risks of overheating economies, uh, overinflated asset prices, uh, over uh, uh, extended uh, shortages of, uh, of labor and other problems. So, so it's a very balanced and, and a delicate situation with which uh, no one in knows how it will uh, unroll going um, uh, forward. But clearly this is uh, one of the risks and, and central banks of course are grappling with the uh, 
the Torah of, uh, of targets, they don't want to see excessive inflation, they don't want to see deflation, they don't want to see negative impact on the labor market, but at the same time they want to also keep a, a, a non too volatile financial markets. And uh, to, to have all of these targets met at the same time uh, may be a bit uh, uh, problematic uh, going forward. And uh, there are areas already where inflation is um, a bit more persistent where, uh, than the central banks would probably like it to be. And one area is housing market, which is, was already uh, addressed a little bit by the previous speaker. And on the left-hand uh, side chart, you can see that these are the real housing prices. So this is adjusted for inflation. Uh, or in other words, it shows how much uh, house prices have been increasing faster than the prices of other goods and services in the respective countries. So in some countries, like in Italy and Germany, you didn't see um, excessive increases in housing prices. They were moving uh, more or less in line uh, with the rest of the prices uh, of goods and services. But in many countries around the world, uh, uh, housing prices have been increasing more rapidly. And uh, part of that reason uh, was, of course, uh, very low interest rates, which have uh, helped to increase um, uh, affordability and at the same time, lack of alternative investments, which also attracted uh, investment capital in this uh, asset market. Equity prices, you can also see uh, they are close to record highs. Um, again, how justified is that? Uh, it depends how you see interest rates going forward. And how, as Andreas said, he sees uh, lower for longer. And if interest rates really stay uh, at a very low levels for a very long time, then there is no bubble uh, in this chart. I mean, uh, uh, the, the fundamental value, which is determined by interest rates, by discount rate, is uh, increased because of the lower price of money. And that's why you see a fundamental shift upwards in uh, real estate prices. Uh, investors require lower rent yields. You see fundamental shift effort upwards in equity prices because investors require lower dividend yield. They have few alternatives. If you want uh, safe investment, uh, you have to accept negative yields from German or Lithuanian uh, bonds. So for many of them, even lower rent yield or almost historically low dividend yield also seems like a better alternative. And uh, indeed, uh, equities look expensive if you measure them by the traditional um, uh, measures. Uh, if you look at cyclically adjusted price to earnings ratio, if you look at the market capitalization as a share of gross national income or Tobin Q, actually whatever indicator, classical indicator, which are described in, in most financial uh, textbooks you take, uh, uh, equities look um, expensive. But they look expensive only if you disregard uh, the price of money. At the same time, we have to remember that uh, base interest rates set by the central banks, uh, government bond yields at, are at the lowest level in history or near the lowest level in history. So discount rate through which we value all the future cash flows, be it from real estate, be it from private equity, be it from uh, equity uh, dividends, um, uh, is actually larger. It's increased by the very low or zero or uh, uh, negative discount uh, rate. So the major questions uh, when we try to answer if the equities or real estate is expensive or too expensive boils down to one thing interest rates. Are they going to go up going forward? How rapidly are they going to go up forward? Uh, are they going to go, gonna go up more rapidly than currently expected by the markets? Um, and our base case forecast that there will not be a, a very large surprises here. Inflation to a large extent will be transitory. Central banks will be patient when it comes to raising interest rates. And uh, that will uh, not create uh, the shock for uh, uh, financial system and, and uh, financial asset prices. But there is a risk. And the risk is, of course, associated with one thing that we talk about throughout all this Swedbank Economic Forum. And that risk is inflation. If inflation gets a little bit, just a little bit out of control, a little bit out of the comfort zone, of the central banks, and you don't need a 10% inflation. You need a sustained inflation of 3-4% in the United States, and Fed will become uh, will be pushed into 
removing the accommodative um, uh, policy, then the yields will rise and valuations of many assets um, will uh, change. And for that reason, we discuss so much about inflation. It's not only because it affects the, the purchasing power of many households all around the world. But that's not, uh, this is not the reason why it's a problem, because in many countries still wages are rising faster than the prices of many goods and services. So that's not an issue. But if that inflation becomes um, entrenched and sustained, if it is pushed upwards forward, uh, going forward by the expectations of high inflation, then the central banks will be forced to act uh, quicker and more forcefully than currently expected in uh, uh, financial markets. And uh, this is the historical relationship between inflation and bond yields. This is very natural. Of course, if you have higher inflation, higher sustained inflation, investors require uh, higher nominal yields to compensate for that, to keep the real yields positive. And you see these five, uh, four dots uh, on this chart. This is the most recent observation in US. On horizontal axis, you have the core CPI. On a vertical axis, you have a US 10-year government bond yield. So these recent observations are a lot outside of the um, historical relationship, meaning that inflation is a lot higher, um, uh, or in other words, the, the government yields are a lot lower than they would be otherwise with this current inflation. But this again illustrates that uh, many of, of the, the financial markets expect that this spike in inflation in the United States above 5% is temporary and will go away, go away next year. If it doesn't, it means that these dots will have to go upwards. It means that the government bond yields will have to go higher. Central banks will have to increase interest rates and uh, bond prices will go down. And uh, bond prices going down, of course, have implications also for other uh, assets, also equities. And in this chart, you can see the relationship between inflation and U.S. stock valuations. Perhaps a bit more, diffi more difficult to read, but in this chart, on a horizontal axis, you see valuations of uh, stocks uh, as a uh, cyclically adjusted P/E ratio. The further it is to the right, the more expensive shares are, and you see the dot where we are today. And on a vertical axis, you see the inflation. Uh, we had in history deflationary periods, we had very inflationary periods, and you can see that historically, uh, equities have been expensive when inflation was low and stable, like it was during the past 20, 25 years. And uh, in this environment, there is no spike in interest rates, and that supports uh, higher equity prices. If we were to run away with the inflation, you don't need to go again to 10% or 20%. If it goes away a bit higher, that will have to push valuations to the lower end, uh, probably by adjustments in equity prices. So again, this is why inflation and, and current trends in inflation are so interesting, interesting and so keenly observed by the uh, economists. And uh, for now, fundamental valuations were not too important. What was driving equity prices was uh, flows into equities. Uh, from all the channels, uh, a lot of investors were moving their money into real estate markets, in equity markets. That is reflected in uh, asset prices. That is reflected in, um, er, in equity prices. And in this chart, you can see um, uh, the red line shows the margin depth in the United States. That, uh, that is the amount of money that is invested in equity market by retail investors, uh, not their own money, but borrowed money. And historically, you've seen that um, there's a spike in margin debt associated with also increasing equity prices and increasing valuations, which is usually followed by at least more volatility and sometimes in more pronounced corrections uh, in equity prices. And this time is uh, somewhat similar. We again see a record high inflows uh, of, in, of retail investors into equity markets, record high uh, margin debt. Um, so this is also a risk uh, or could be a bellwether of upcoming volatility in equity markets. And um, just yesterday I had a notification on, on my phone uh, uh, and Instagram influencers are moving stocks like never before. So this is a new era where we have a, a new financial advisors on Instagram, on TikTok, on all the social media. And it's not uh, very only very well-known influencers that um, express their opinion on uh, where what stocks to buy or what assets to buy or what crypto assets to buy and they have very profound and quick impact on this price asset prices it's also tons of different um, 
experts, self-proclaimed experts, which uh, share, share their advice on TikTok, on Instagram. And I, I have collected a, a number of screenshots, uh, what kind of videos you can observe on, on TikTok, on Instagram, uh, what kind of advices they give you, how to make $1 million in four months, um, what kind of uh, clothes they are wearing to make an impression on you and to attract your attention. Uh, there was a very popular uh, genre of um, advising how to invest your stimulus in the United States, given by the government, $600 check, how to turn it into $13,000. Uh, um, so, and it's not a, a, a fringe uh, advisors that you see on the social media. I mean, all of them have millions of views. Not all of those viewers make financial decisions on that. Some of them view them for the entertainment or education like I do. But still, that shows you, and it correlates with the previous slide that I have shown you, with the increase in margin debt. There is uh, irrational exuberance in financial markets, uh, and it is also reflected in these trends in, uh, in, uh, in Instagram and other social media. We have seen this year another interesting new phenomenon, organized crowds and meme stocks. On uh, Reddit, the group uh, called Wall Street Bets has uh, more than 10 million uh, users and they make coordinated decisions to buy some particular assets, even if these companies are going bankrupt and have no cash flows, so no prospect to recover, they can push up their prices uh, to historical highs and record highs. Um, we have seen that with GameStop, we have seen that the AMC and with other uh, companies. So this is a, a new thing in financial markets uh, where it's not a fundamental analysis. Uh, it's not a fundamental value that matters, uh, not the future cash flows, but only the flows of funds into these assets that can change their value, at least in a short and medium term, uh, uh, dramatically. Uh, cryptocurrencies, of course, uh, is not a new thing, uh, but I would just uh, like to point out your attention on the market capitalization. Yes, Bitcoin is almost one trillion, but you also have a Dogecoin, which was created as a parody of cryptocurrencies. Its capitalization is now 30 billion uh, dollars. Uh, that's um, something like half of uh, uh, Lithuanian uh, annual GDP. And it still is a parody. It's not used as a mean of transaction. Uh, you can use that as a digital asset. Uh, and uh, a lot of these digital assets have gained in prominence and in value uh, recently. How sustained is that? What happens if regulators are starting to more keenly regulate uh, what is behind them? Um, I would not be so sure and, and so enthusiastic in um, and, and, and as you know, if you follow the Swedish Economic Forum, you know that I'm, I'm still very skeptical. I'm not changing my view that Bitcoin is an innovation that pollutes the environment without solving any uh, humanity problems. Uh, so that is not a good innovation. And uh, the last thing that I wanted to mention is the new hot uh, trend this year. It's non-fungible token. Uh, it is described as a uh, it, it's a registration of a digital object's ownership on a blockchain. So somewhere on a, blo uh, on a blockchain, there is a registration that you own that asset. Ownership is only uh, to a limited extent because uh, people can still see that uh, object, they can use it, there is no copyright, they can share it freely. So for example, I share the picture with you of Nian Cat. I do not own it. Somebody bought it this year for $600,000. So they own it, the digital assets, but uh, the, the, the ownership is very uh, relative, let's put it this way. Another uh, um, purchase in the NFT market this year was the picture of this uh, Shiba Inu dog. Uh, and some investor paid $4 million for it. Again, they don't own this picture, they own the bragging rights that they own this digital asset. They don't own, own a copyright. I can use this picture, I can show it to you, you can enjoy the beautiful picture of this dog. Um, and this will not generate any cash flow for the buyer of this uh, picture. And there were even more crazier purchases in the NFT, non-fungible token markets this year. One of the most recent one was uh, three weeks ago. Uh, somebody bought a picture of this rock for $1.4 million. $1.4 million for one of these rocks. And you can still go uh, online and buy one of the 
two remaining rocks and be a proud owner of this digital uh, rock that has no functionality, no uh, future uh, cash flows. So this is the strange and curious case of the asset markets that we live in. The most expensive non-fungible token sold this year was a, a, a painting by Beeple, a, a collage of um, uh, 5,000 uh, small pictures for $69 million. But if you don't have $69, $69 million, you could have bought another uh, NFT, and that's a one pixel. One pixel for $1.4 million. Bought and sold this year. And my final slide, yes, it can get even crazier. The same picture that was sold and bought by, by somebody for $4 million, uh, somebody has decided that you can make a fractional non-fungible tokens. So divide this picture into many, many pixels and sell each pixel of this Shiba Inu doc. And this was done this month. And at the beginning of September, the value of all the pixels of this doc, which is owned by nobody, was worth actually at one point half a billion dollars. So this is the curious case of the asset markets uh, today. It looks and sounds crazy, but um, this is the environment that we live in uh, uh, today. Uh, and uh, uh, we will discuss maybe about this uh, after all the presentations, um, but uh, I just wanted to illustrate how uh, inflation and monetary policy is important not only for the real estate markets, not only for the equity markets, but also for very uh, strange new asset markets that are being created. And all of these things that I have shown you have actually happened only during the first nine months of 2021. And uh, we move on to more important things, uh, which is the local economies and local economic developments. We have two more final presentations on the Baltic countries. And I invite now uh, my colleague Liva, chief economist at Swedbank uh, Latvia, who will share her insights on what is happening in Baltic countries and what we can expect um, going forward. Liva? Hello, everyone. Uh, I hope you can hear me. Uh, I just wanted to say uh, that uh, I think Nereus' uh, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. So these things, I guess, uh, work in terms of uh, financial asset innovations, if you want to call them that, until they don't, right? So, uh, but when we move to, uh, to the Baltics, and uh, of course, you heard a lot about the global environment and about what we see, uh, what we see as risks there. And of course, in some, in one way or another, it is reflected also in the Baltic states. But, um, but uh, more on that um, uh, in the presentation. So I'll start just by saying what we have seen lately in uh, terms of GDP numbers. And uh, uh, one must say that the latest GDP data is very strong. Uh, there is strong growth in uh, all of the Baltics. Uh, if we look at the first half of the year, then Estonia has been really surprising us with an 8.5% uh, growth um, in the first half of the year over the previous year. Latvia is growing by 5.1% and Lithuania by 4.7%. So everywhere the growth is strong. And the most important thing, all, uh, all economies are above the pre-crisis levels already. Uh, but not, of course, uh, not, uh, we cannot say that about all sectors. And also, we are doing better than, uh, for example, the euro area, which is still um, some, some way behind, <clears throat> behind uh, the pre-crisis levels. Uh, if we look at the sectoral developments and in each of the countries, then uh, we do some uh, do see uh, some uh, similarities. And uh, well, one of the things that uh, one must um, highlight, of course, is the developments in the I ICT sector, so uh, information and communications sector, especially in Estonia, which uh, has been responsible for for the very uh, fast growth uh, there. And with uh, what we see right now as uh, the investment by Volkswagen, the oh, outlook on this sector is also looking quite bright in the in the future in Estonia. Uh, but ICT sector has done well also in Lithuania and uh, Latvia. Another uh, notable um, uh, 
um, boost to growth has come from the industry, uh, which is uh, so manufacturing uh, mostly, which of course is uh, really benefiting thanks to the strong uh, growth uh, worldwide and uh, thanks to the strong demand everywhere. And uh, we are we are therefore it's not very surprising to see uh, this sector up there with the growth drivers uh, in all of the Baltics. Uh, if we look at uh, and of course especially maybe here we, we have to highlight Lithuania's case where you have the the success story of, um, of the chemical products manufacturing with Thermo Fisher Scientific producing vaccine reagents. And, and this is certainly giving a boost uh, to overall growth um, in Lithuania. If we look at what is dragging the growth down, then it is uh, certainly still the sectors that have been most hurt by the crisis. So you can see arts and entertainment uh, there. Uh, and even though we saw pretty strong growth in Q2, it is uh, these sectors all of them, uh, also um, accommodation, for example, they are still below the levels that uh, we observed pre-crisis. So there is still some way to uh, to catch up there. And um, it is also construction that is right now is kind of lagging the economy. But of course, <clears throat> as you all know, with the investments, with the EU funds that are coming in, this uh, sector is unlikely to stay uh, down there and, and the, the prospects of it are quite bright. Um, and it's uh, another another poor uh, performer is agriculture, which is perhaps likely due to the uh, very hot weather that we have seen uh, this year is not going to be as strong as um, as we saw agriculture last year, especially in Latvia and Lithuania. Uh, if we move to the forecasts, then. Um, uh, then, of course, if you look at the closer, so the closer uh, future, then we are not completely out of the woods yet. I mean, we do see that uh, that the case count of uh, the virus cases is uh, rising, and uh, this uh, is expected uh, to have some impact on the economies, but it has to be, it is expected to be much, much um, uh, lower than what we saw in the previous waves. Uh, and But especially worrying is, of course, the situation in Latvia, where we see that uh, the uh, the vaccination coverage is below 50% of the population. So below 50% of the population has received at least one dose of vaccine. Uh, and this, of course, given the approaching uh, winter, given the uh, Delta uh, variant and the spread of that, is especially worrying. And um, especially in combination with the fact that we are, um, that Latvia is going to see parliamentary elections in 2022. So the policies are likely to be pretty toothless and perhaps uh, moving too slowly in case of a uh, serious uh, need. Uh, but overall, the next uh, few years are going to see growth that is above potential, uh, both due to fiscal and monetary stimulus that is still going to be there, uh, also due to substantial EU funds inflow, due to confident households and also confident businesses. And we're going to see all of that resulting in, uh, in growth that is uh, that, that is notably above the potential. Uh, of course, uh, there are some um, particular uh, um, factors affecting the growth of each of the economies. For example, in Estonia, near-term growth is going to be boosted by the pension reform, whereas, in, for example, in Lithuania, near-term growth uh, in, in 2022 could be uh, dragged down slightly by the, uh, by the issues with uh, Belarus and uh, with the transportation uh, sector there. Uh, but overall, picture is pretty bright. Um, if we look at, um, if we move on to, sorry, I cannot, um, yep. Uh, if we move on to what's happening in the labor market, then we do see that labor market uh, is uh, improving. It is tightening. Uh, we do see unemployment rates uh, uh, slowly approaching the pre-crisis levels. And uh, we do see that um, actually monthly uh, wage growth has stayed very high throughout the crisis. And right now is also uh, climbing and uh, proving to be very, very resilient. And on the one hand, there are some structural and policy effects that are um, that are playing there. But on the other hand, it is increasingly due to labor shortages that we uh, that we um, experience also in the Baltics. And if we talk about labor shortages, then of course you, we, uh, my colleagues already mentioned that uh, that uh, th this is a problem in globally. It's a problem in the Nordics and it is also a problem in the Baltics. Uh, we see that labor shortages have climbed um, 
are climbing higher and higher. The breather was quite short uh, during the crisis. And right now, companies are uh, increasing their um, their willingness to hire uh, workers. And uh, this is reflected in increasing shortages. Uh, and of course, if you think about the future, then the population forecasts um, in, uh, so this is in 2030, so in, 10, in about 10 years, are actually quite gloomy. If we look at the Eurostat baseline projections, then Latvian population is going to decrease by 10%, Lithuanian by 8 Estonian by less, so by 2%. But in general, of course, this is not set in stone. Uh, I mean, this still can be changed by policy uh, changes. Uh, if migration patterns change, this is not uh, this is not a uh, a certainty. Uh, but what we can uh, observe from here is that uh, working age population. Uh, is on a decline very likely unless there are major changes, and this uh, means that labor shortages are likely here to stay. Um, and therefore, so this is one actually of the reasons why we uh, believe that the private sector will be pushed to invest. So labor shortage is um, is going to be a problem. Is it right now a problem? Is going to be a problem going forward? Another issue is of course uh, the uh, very uh, well. So first of all, it's the underinvestment that we have seen uh, previously. Uh, if we look at uh, investment as a share of GDP in all three of the Baltic states, it has been rather low. If we uh, look at the pre-crisis year, so 2019, uh, for Latvia and uh, Lithuania, it has been extremely low. For Estonia, maybe a bit higher. But in general, if we are at or are below even euro area levels in terms of how actively we invest there is no hope of really catching up to the european uh, to the euro area levels of um, of living and of living standards therefore investment uh, really needs to be pushed up and of course what we do see now is also this uh, quite uh, high capacity utilization, which, given the strong growth that is expected also globally, uh, should uh, feel even more pressure. Therefore, uh, the, um, therefore the um, push to invest will be there. And, um, and a third uh, reason for investment is, of course, the fact that the world is uh, fighting climate change. And uh, more and more often, uh, we will need to think about this as a, um, as a, as a, reason for increased investment and of changing the ways in which we are working and of course those that will be moving first will be uh, will be better ready to to well accept and uh, make the most out of the uh, new world order if you will and uh, therefore we expect that uh, average yearly investment growth is going to be materially higher in the next uh, uh, three years, maybe except for Estonia, because we have this uh, Volkswagen story, which is uh, a bit distorting the data that we are seeing now. But in general, uh, investment should be increasing in, um, in the next couple of years. And uh, not least, of course, because of what we are seeing in the uh, public sector, uh, it, it is this EU money inflow that is uh, going to be there in the next uh, um, in the next planning period. And of course, uh, the question is, is there more money than ever? And uh, the answer is yes and no. So if we look at the absolute terms, there is certainly more. Um, and uh, this is uh, the, the switch from 2014 to 2020 uh, uh, to the 2021-27 period is certainly seeing increased um, increased uh, EU funding in the region. Uh, but if we look at uh, this uh, share of GDP that this funding will represent, it is actually quite similar to what we've seen before. But uh, so what is the worrisome uh, factor? It is, of course, the timing. And uh, the timing is uh, uh, what we're seeing is going to be a front loading of these investments in the next uh, two, three years. And uh, this will uh, likely put a pressure on the construction sector, because a lot of this, uh, uh, these funds are going to pass through construction sector. And uh, with uh, the construction sector uh, already now experiencing some troubles uh, in terms of uh, labor shortages, we are likely to see these, um, these pressures there uh, uh, only rise. Um, and if we move from invest from this business side to uh, and uh, 
public sector side to the household side, then of course, we're also going to see a, um, an increase in consumption. If we look at uh, the current situation, then household consumption in Estonia and Lithuania has recovered. In Latvia, maybe not yet, but we're expecting it uh, to get there in the, in the coming um, quarters, especially with a a strong boost in Q3 of this year because, of course, Latvian uh, restrictions were a bit longer. So this is the reason why we are lagging behind, very likely. And if we look at the card spending data, for example, we see that um, the activity is there and the willingness to spend is there. And, uh, of course, why we think that com com uh, consumption will be rising in the next uh, couple of years uh, is, of course, first, the rising income that you saw we are already seeing rising wages. We will see labor shortages, which will mean that the wage uh, wages are going to be uh, pushed to increase more and more. Um, of course, another uh, uh, another. Um, point to make is that uh, we are seeing right now uh, increased household savings. Uh, they, these have been accumulated during the crisis. Uh, on the one hand, some of this might be uh, spent um, post the crisis and once uh, the economy is uh, are, are reopening. On the other hand, a lot of this is uh, is uh, saved up in the uh, in the uh, accounts of uh, the richer households. Therefore. And these have different spending patterns and these could be in, uh, households could be investing maybe in real estate uh, or maybe saving up more rather than really spending all of this. But what is uh, certainly going to be uh, driving consumption in uh, Estonia and what is going to be a short term spike in uh, in consumption is uh, going to be due to this uh, pension uh, fund reform pension reform that we have seen and uh, we've seen. More, uh, around 1 billion euros enter the deposits of uh, households in September. Uh, what we have uh, been observing is that um, clients are quick, quite quick to spend this money already. It's either for the repayment of loans or uh, for... Uh, for investment in the stock market or maybe investment in real estate, also for buying cars and just simple uh, simple consumption. And in general, this will boost the uh, uh, boost the consumption story here. But of course, injection of a of the second pillar funds in the economy at a time uh, of a strong economic activity is is a risk uh, for, that could lead to uh, overheating. And uh, we will talk about um, the prices uh, and inflation levels over the longer uh, horizon a bit uh, later on. Um, uh, and of course, uh, I, uh, I mentioned already the real estate market, and we do see that the real estate market, uh, the housing market has been uh, booming lately. Uh, even the, during the crisis, uh, the prices uh, did not drop. Uh, and uh, what we're seeing right now, uh, this is the, uh, the results of the first half of the year. They might uh, even, uh, like if you want to buy a new apartment right now, these uh, these um, uh, these growth figures of prices are actually uh, even much higher because what we see now in the data is, of course, the, the um, apartments that have been finished in uh, Q2, but for the ones that are just being uh, where the agreements are just being signed, there this uh, price story is much uh, higher. Uh, of course, driven by the global uh, prices and the increase in um, in construction costs. And if we look at uh, the transactions, then um, transaction figures for Vilnius and Tallinn are uh, almost double the amount than uh, than they are for Riga. So what we're expecting is that Riga will be catching up in the uh, coming years, uh, whereas in Tallinn and um, and uh, Estonia, in uh, in Estonia and Lithuania, the banks, the central banks, are already starting to get worried about uh, uh, about the real estate market there. Um, and if we look at uh, the price pressures, then of course. Uh, uh, given the global prices, given the um, uh, given what we've heard from uh, from my colleagues uh, previously, of course the uh, Baltic states are also feeling this uh, uh, this push from uh, uh, global uh, global prices uh, also here. So first of all, it is the pro uh, producer prices, the construction costs that are uh, rising, and uh, slowly we're also seeing uh, this uh, turn into higher consumer prices. Uh, in Latvia, maybe not uh, not as pronounced uh, yet, but in uh, Lithuania and Estonia, inflation is already uh, five percent and above that. And what we're going to see is 
very likely that uh, the the top um, inflation figures are going to be reached by the end of this year or maybe the beginning of uh, the next year. But uh, what I m must uh, mention is that purchasing power is still likely to be fairly high. And why is that so? Because of the wage story that I was telling uh, previously, wages are right now growing by 10%, maybe a bit of an exaggeration in uh, Lithuania and, and Latvia, but in general, the wage growth is quite high. Therefore, even with the strong inflation figures, the purchasing power overall should still be, uh, should still be there. And of course, the risks are, are here uh, for the, uh, for the, uh, uh, future periods, because what we're seeing right now is, of course, that price pressures are currently external. But later on, these will turn into domestic price pressures more and more. First of all, the wage story. Second of all, the cons uh, the uh, construction sector um, activity that was uh, that will uh, going to that is going to increase and push the construction costs uh, yeah, up even more, and especially this is risky given what we heard before that uh, with global commodity and transport prices remaining elevated perhaps for a bit longer than we thought, uh, this uh, this will this might push uh, inflation even higher than we're thinking right now. So the risks are uh, certainly there, and uh, last uh, but not least, I wanna say a word on um, on uh, the uh, government sector, which uh, right uh, now is still supporting the economy and uh, the government's willingness to run deficits also is raising risks. So public debt is still well below EU average, uh, but it can become problematic if uh, larger debts are financing current spending rather than smart investment and reforms. And especially uh, it's worrying uh, right now in Latvia because we are the elections are coming up and of course the um, the temptation to spend, the temptation to buy the votes are is quite large there. Uh, therefore, risks are also increased. So that, that would be it from my side. Um, overall, this is the strong growth that is expected is ever more going to be based on domestic demand rather than exports. And uh, of course, uh, our base case scenario assumes that uh, overheating can be avoided, but uh, but there, the risks are uh, certainly there. And we definitely need higher investment as a response to labor shortages and also to global demand uh, growth. Uh, and we need this investment on the side of businesses uh, because this is necessary to boost productivity and also to keep our competitiveness um, of the Baltic economies. And I think my colleague will talk uh, more about the competitiveness later. Thank you, Thank you Liva. And uh, yes, Baltic countries are very open, uh, small economies, which means that uh, their prospects going forward will depend not on household consumption, not on government spending and not, not on uh, social benefits, uh, but on our ability to export. And on that, uh, I invite uh, my colleague Tono, chief economist in uh, Estonia, uh, Swedbank Estonia, who will uh, very briefly illustrate what is happening and what has been happening with the uh, Baltic uh, export markets, uh, export structure, how it is changing and what we can expect going forward. Tono? As uh, Nerius already mentioned is that uh, the Baltic countries are small but open economies and therefore what is happening with the competitiveness uh, of exports is very important for us. Now, uh, it's not so uh, easy to understand uh, export competitiveness when we look at, uh, say, one, two or three years. We sometimes also have to look longer period as well. When you look at um, export share of goods, what has happened with export share of goods, uh, then you see that in Estonia and in Lithuania, the share of export of goods in GDP has dropped during the last 10 years. In Latvia, it has been uh, relatively stable. The reason behind is that in Estonia, the share of uh, mobile equipment, um, refined oil products uh, exports has dropped. But in, in Lithuania, the reason has been uh, mainly uh, related to, uh, to the Russian, uh, um, uh, Russian embargo in 2014, which affected mostly food products, agriculture and transport. 
Now, when we look at uh, export share of services, then uh, you, you see here that uh, in Lithuania, there has been enormous increase of um, export share of services in GDP. And this is due to the um, transportation, cost, uh, transportation uh, services, uh, which is more than half of the um, uh, export services in, in Lithuania. And this, this is increasing, uh, this is increasing um, uh, quite strongly. Now, um, when we look at export volumes, how the export volumes have be, uh, behaved during the last 10 years compared to other countries, we see that in the Baltic countries, export volumes have increased uh, considerably more compared to either Euro era 19, uh, Finland, Germany, or Sweden. And especially this uh, difference comes uh, from, uh, from export services increase in Lithuania, as you see here, this uh, green curve on, on the right, uh, right side uh, graph. Now, what has happened with um, export markets? There have been certainly some structural shifts uh, among major export markets during the pandemic period, when we now look at uh, recent years. In Estonia, we see um, the share of um, exports we, we export to Finland has, um, has dropped gradually, but at the same time, the export share to US has increased. But this is primarily linked to uh, a mobile equipment, which is, uh, which is the production of, uh, of Ericsson, and this goes uh, primarily to 5G, uh, 5G um, uh, in, 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 in the United States. In Latvia, we see there is also uh, probably the most remarkable is the drop uh, of export to Russia. And in Lithuania, we also see um, uh, several shifts in, in different, different countries. These are the five largest export markets for all uh, Baltic countries. Now, regarding um, exported goods, uh, there is now the difference uh, between Estonia and Latvia, Estonia and Lithuania, which um, uh, these graphs are, are about export of goods of country origin, but unfortunately, unfortunately for Latvia, we don't have um, country origin export data. And what we uh, see here is that um, in Estonia, the share of um, mineral products, it's mineral, it's refined oil products, this share has increased considerably. And here, uh, there are two main reasons. One is volume, and also there is the price issue as well, as these, uh, uh, the price of refined oil products has increased, the price has increased uh, uh, very strongly. In Latvia, um, the changes are relatively um, uh, small, certainly some structural shifts among major, major exported goods. But what, what, when we look at uh, Lithuania, in Lithuania, we see that uh, there is a remarkable increase in chemical products, which is related to uh, thermoscientific uh, Baltic production, uh, which is exported. Uh, and at the same time, the drop of uh, mineral products uh, in, in the structure of exported, of exported goods. Now, um, uh, when we uh, look at um, uh, the next slide, uh, this is now more closer to the um, competitiveness uh, issue. When um, um, the labor, when the labor cost uh, increases faster than productivity. This means that uh, unit labor cost increases as well. The more the unit labor cost increases, this means that uh, uh, the country can uh, can lose or uh, uh, can lose the, the price competitiveness or cost competitiveness of its production as well as in, as well as exports. And as we see uh, on the left side graph is that when we compare uh, Baltic countries with uh, Germany, Finland, Sweden, then this unit labor cost, which is based on hours worked, uh, has increased uh, more compared to the, these countries. And especially this is the case for Lithuania, uh, less, for, uh, less for Estonia, which means that in principle, this shows us that uh, 
Baltic uh, countries are gradually losing price competitiveness against uh, against the trading partners. Certainly, when we look at um, export prices, manufacturing products export prices, then export prices have increased uh, almost everywhere. And when we compare Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania, then in in Lithuania, export prices actually have increased less compared to uh, to other Baltic countries. However, the increased uh, share of uh, Baltic countries' export in OECD refers uh, to improved competitiveness. And we see here that uh, the export market share of goods as well as uh, services has increased in, uh, in OECD. Now, when we look at uh, euro area, um, in euro area, the share of uh, Baltic countries' exports has actually gradually increased already before, especially that was the case in Estonia. But that increase uh, accelerated uh, during the pandemic uh, period. Certainly, uh, when uh, we look at like um, a more general picture around the, the globe, around the world, then uh, Despite the export share of um, uh, Baltic countries' uh, uh, export share is, is very small in the global market, then uh, our export behaves relatively similar to what is happening on, on, on world trade as, as, as a total. Now, when we look now um, by countries, what has happened with, uh, with the major ex export partners, then uh, Regarding Estonia, we can say that in principle, Estonia has increased its export shares of goods on its major trade partners' markets. You see here that there is a very large drop of uh, the share of Estonian exports to Sweden, uh, which is now gradually improving or, or, uh, uh, or increasing. And this comes primarily from the drop of mobile equipment. We exported mobile equipment uh, uh, before directly to Sweden, now this is um, uh, this is exported now to other markets. Uh, when we look at uh, Latvia, in Latvia, I think the most important uh, thing is that Latvia has increased its market share in in Germany. It has increased its market share in Estonia, Latvia. Also increased its uh, market share in Sweden as well, but uh, during the last two years, uh, Sweden actually lost its um, its uh, market uh, share in Sweden, and this uh, comes uh, primarily. This is the reason um, of uh, mainly uh, wood products as well as uh, chemical products, which uh, which Latvia is losing its market share on Sweden on Sweden on Swedish market. Regarding Lithuania, there is a more mix, mixed picture. Uh, Lithuania is increasing its market share in Germany, Netherlands, Sweden. Um, uh, the picture uh, regarding uh, Latvia is relatively mixed, and this is primarily related to um, uh, energy products and Poland. Uh, Lithuania has lost um, its market share in, in, uh, in Poland primarily due to the nominal, uh, drop of the nominal value of um, plastics, dairy products, as well as mineral products. Um, just very briefly about um, the, uh, the picture about Belarus. Uh, just to say in summary that uh, Baltic countries are losing, uh, or that the uh, trade balance against Belarus is, uh, is wor has worsened during the pandemic years. Um, and this means that we are importing more compared to what we are exporting. But the shares of exports are very small, especially, especially uh, in Estonia and, uh, and Latvia's export to Belarus. And now my last slide is about um, um, is about operating surplus and compensation of employees. Operating surplus is not exactly the um, uh, profit uh, profit figure, but it is very uh, similar or proxy figure to the enterprise's profit. 
And what we see here is that this uh, operating surplus share in GDP in all Baltic countries has um, dropped during the last uh, 10 years. And this is primarily the reason of the um, increasing uh, compensation of employees. So it means that uh, so long as long as our um, compensation of employees uh, or the um, labor costs are increasing compared to how large is the turnover of employees, uh, so long um, our profitability will be under pressure. Thank you. Well, now I want to thank all the clients that joined us for the past uh, two hours and uh, all the six speakers from five different countries that were delivering their insights to clients in three Baltic countries. Thank you again and I'll see you next year, hopefully not on my screen. Bye.